people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and presidents of Central Asian countries held first India Central Asia Summit to discuss the common vision, regional security and stability. They also committed to have a comprehensive partnership in coming times and work jointly for the welfare of war torn Afghanistan. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi hosted the first India-Central Asia Summit in virtual format this week, which was attended by Presidents of Republic of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz Republic, Republic of Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Republic of Uzbekistan. This first India-Central Asia Summit coincided with the 30th anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relations between India and Central Asian countries. During the summit, Prime Minister Modi and Central Asia leaders discussed the next steps in taking the India-Central Asia relations to new heights. Today's summit has three important objectives. The first one is to say that the relationship between Central Asia and India is a relationship between the relationship between the relationship between the relationship. भारत की तरफ से मैं यह स्पष्ट करना चाहूंगा कि सेंट्रल एशिया इज सेंट्रल टू इंडिया विजन ऑफ एन इंटीग्रेटेड एंड स्टेबल एक्सटेडेड नेबरहुड दूसरा उद्देश्य हमारे सहयोग को एक प्रभावी स्ट्रक्चर देना है इससे विभिन्न स्तरों पर और विभिन्न स्टेक होल्डर्स के बीच रेगुलर इंटरेक्शन का एक ढांचा स्थापित होगा और तीसरा उद्देश्य हमारे सहयोग के लिए एक महत्वाकांक्षी रोडमैप बनाना है इन हिस्टोरिक डिसीजन the leaders agreed to institutionalize the summit mechanism by deciding to hold it every two years the leaders also discussed the evolving situation in Afghanistan. They reiterated their strong support for a peaceful, secure and stable Afghanistan with a truly representative and inclusive government. Modi conveyed India's continued commitment to provide humanitarian assistance to the Afghan people and urged leaders to further improve their cooperation in order to counter potential challenges that might prop up from an unstable Afghanistan. क्षेत्रीय सुरक्षा के लिए हम सभी की चिंताएं और उद्देश्य एक समान है अफगानिस्तान के घटनाक्रम से हम सभी चिंतित हैं इस संदर्भ में भी हमारा आपसी सहयोग क्षेत्रीय सुरक्षा और स्थिरता के लिए और महत्वपूर्ण हो गया है The leaders discussed far-reaching proposals to further cooperation in areas of trade and connectivity, development cooperation, defense and security, and in particular on cultural and people-to-people -people contacts. These included a roundtable on energy and connectivity, joint working groups at senior official level on Afghanistan, and use of Chabahar port showcasing of Buddhist exhibitions in Central Asian countries and commissioning of an India-Central Asia Dictionary of Common Words, joint counter-terrorism exercises, visit of 100-member youth delegation annually from Central Asian countries to India, and special courses for Central Asian diplomats. A comprehensive joint declaration was adopted by the leaders that enumerates their common vision for an enduring and comprehensive India-Central Asia partnership. Moving on, 
After India and Nepal, the Omicron variant has hit another South Asian country with Pakistan recording the highest single-day cases ever since the pandemic outbreak. The government has imposed stricter curbs and is planning to ramp up vaccination drive. However, the experts are critical of the government's move, saying it is not just doing enough to contain the spread. A sudden spike in the number of infections has sent worrying signals to authorities in Pakistan. With over 7,000 cases, the country recorded its largest single-day count ever last week. Pakistan authorities say that the positivity rate is around 13%, but the observers have argued against it, saying that it is due to the low testing that the country has managed these figures. Karachi, the country's largest city, has one out of every two people tested positive. The vaccination drive in the country, which has largely relied on other countries' supply, hasn't given promising results as yet. However, the government of Pakistan has already paved the way for the booster doses for healthcare workers and people who are over 30 and immunocompromised. Not just the government, the common citizens in Pakistan had also grown complacent with decline in the number of cases in the previous wave, but now the centers are witnessing a spike in those turning up for the doses. लोगों का रुझान तो है बूस्टर्स के लिए भी लोग आ रहे हैं ठीक है ना सेकंड डोजेस भी जिन लोगों ने होल्ड कर दी थी वो लोग भी जो है वो अब रुक कर रहे हैं सेकंड डोजेस के लिए जिनका फोर टू फाइव मंथ्स का गैप है तो डेफिनेटली लोगों में रुझान तो डेवलप हुआ है वो जो बीच में एक ब्रेक आ गया था तो अब लोगों ने जो है वो उस ब्रेक को जो है वो कंप्लीट करना जो है वो शुरू कर दिया है तो ठीक है थोड़ा सा तेजी आएगी उम्मीद तो यही है हमारी कि लोग आएंगे Vaccination of children over the age of 12 has been made mandatory to attend the schools and children under 12 will attend schools with 50% attendance. About 70 million people in Pakistan or 32% of the population have had two vaccine doses. Despite this low immunization and the World Health Organization issuing repeated warnings about not ignoring the pandemic as yet, Many people in Pakistan are of the view that the country has passed its worst phase and there is nothing to worry about anymore. Dar khauf to nahi hai kyunki shuru shuru mein tha jab March mein pichle saalon mein jab corona aaya to usme logon mein dar khauf tha uske saath saath kyunki hamari government ne us badi awareness paida ki hamari media ne hamare tamam mamlaat ne jo NCOC ne unhone to log bashaur ho gaye hain ab unko tamam pata hai ki kyunki ये एक बीमारी है वबा है जिसको हम अपने तरीके से टैकल करना है सोशल तरीके से हम उसी तरीके से जिंदगी गुजारनी उस वबा के साथ As per the data released by the government bodies the infection ratio in Pakistan is lower as compared to other south asian countries however pressing questions have been asked of the government regarding the tests conducted by it Pakistan, which is six smaller than neighboring India in terms of population, has conducted an average 50 to 60,000 tests per day compared to India, where around 1.9 million tests are being done per day, around 30 times more. The government is, however, under the impression that what it is doing is in the right direction. आजकल हम कोरोना की इस लहर में गुजर रहे हैं पांचवी लहर है बहुत सारे केसेस हैं बड़े शहरों में लगातार नजर आ रहे हैं कराची में आप देख रहे हैं 40 फीसद से ऊपर जा चुकी है पॉजिटिविटी लाहौर इस्लामाबाद हैदराबाद दीगर शहरों पिंडी इधर भी केसेस बढ़ रहे हैं और आपने एनसीओसी के जरिए इसके बारे में इकदाम भी सुने और वैक्सीनेशन भी लग रही है Pakistan's largest city, Karachi, had earlier launched a door-to-door -door campaign to vaccinate women who are lagging behind men in rates of coronavirus inoculation. The government claims that it has been taking all steps to keep COVID variances spread in check and testing will be ramped up in coming times. 
However, as per several media reports, even after nearly two years of pandemic outbreak in the country, Pakistan has failed to manage even good testing kits. The majority of COVID-19 testing in Pakistan may be yielding inaccurate results, according to health experts who reported that nearly 80% of imported testing kits were of substandard quality. There is no uniform national policy regarding COVID-19 testing in Pakistan, resulting in unregulated testing practices and the use of low-quality kits in many health facilities. Moving on, the United Nations has once again sounded an alarm on a rapidly deteriorating Afghan situation. Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the country was hanging by a thread with millions reeling under extreme poverty. He also said the education and social services of the country stood on the brink of collapse. The Taliban, who were on a reach-out trip to Oslo this week, have been asking for their recognition, but all their efforts have so far met a skeptic and unconvinced international community, which seems to believe that the Taliban with money would pave a way for a full-fledged return of the group that only brought death, destruction and misery for Afghans in their previous rule. United Nations have been repeatedly urging the governments and groupings around the world to step forward in order to enable Afghanistan to fend for itself. In its latest discussion on the war-torn country, the global body predicted an irreversible doom if Afghanistan was not helped immediately. Antonio Guterres, the General Secretary of the UN, said the country's situation was hanging by a thread and poverty and misery had crept in since the Taliban's takeover of the country. Six months after the takeover by the Taliban, Afghanistan is hanging by a thread. For Afghans, daily life has become a frozen hell. The prime focus of all UN appeals made in the past few weeks has revolved around boosting the liquidity potential of the country. Guterres called for the countries to issue general licenses covering transactions necessary to all humanitarian activities. I repeat my call to issue general licenses covering transactions necessary to all humanitarian activities. We need to give financial institutions and commercial partners legal assurance and they can work, that they can work with humanitarian operators without fear of breaching sanctions. Few international players have started to assist Afghanistan in their own ways, but that hasn't just proved sufficient for a population of around 39 million. In December, donors to a frozen World Bank-administered Afghan Reconstruction Trust Fund agreed to transfer 280 million US dollars to the World Food Program and UN Children's Agency UNICEF to support nutrition and health in Afghanistan. The United Nations earlier this month appealed for 4.4 billion US dollars in humanitarian aid for Afghanistan in 2022. This week it said it needed a further 3.6 billion US dollars for health and education, basic infrastructure, promotion of livelihoods and social cohesion, especially the needs of women and girls. Some 9.5 billion US dollars in Afghan central bank reserves remain blocked outside the country and international support given to previous government has dried up since the Taliban seized power last August. We need to jumpstart Afghanistan's economy through increased liquidity. We must pull the economy back from the brink. And this means finding ways to free up frozen currency reserves and re-engage Afghanistan's central bank. Earlier, the United Nations had pledged to work with countries to ensure that funds are not diverted or misused. However, UN Special Envoy on Afghanistan, Deborah Alliance, has confirmed that there was a still reluctance among donors to free up funds. 
The Taliban are reaching out to different countries explaining their current stance and seeking recognition. However, no one has yet confirmed in that direction. In fact, most of them have maintained a safe distance from Taliban's key demand. The 1996-2001 Taliban rule had provided shelter to terrorist groups including Al-Qaeda and that has been the center of concern for the international community including the United States even today. The fear a return of a similar regime would not just internally destabilize the country but would also pose a major threat to the global peace and security and the developments that have come at a cost of thousands of human lives and trillions of dollars will reverse to square one. Moving on. As hundreds of thousands of Afghans wonder what their future would be like, there are a few dozens who are hoping to have a better life as they set off for a journey in different countries. Several of them who were rescued a few months back are being shifted to different countries. Noria Neda, a single mother who wants to have a good life for her children, is optimistic about the transfer and getting a permanent residence outside her own war-torn country. Noria Neda is one of the several thousand Afghans whose lives have turned upside down in the past five months. As she prepares to leave her hotel room in central Athens for Australia, where she will settle as per the arrangement done by the authorities, she is optimistic of a better future. The 28-year-old lawyer and widow was evacuated from Afghanistan by the Greek government in October with five-year-old son Hozabro and her eight-month-old girl Gohar Shah after she became a target by the Taliban for her involvement in supporting women's rights as director of the Pasu legal organization Mazari Sharif. When uh, I got the uh, visa for Australia, I, I searched in the internet. I searched about the states, about the customs, about the law as well, about the, um, I saw some videos, some pictures. It was really interesting and uh, exactly I'm excited now to go to Australia and see the, uh, maybe I can see, see my uh, new life, new house, new room. It's something uh, exciting. For three months, she has been crammed in this small room, waiting for the next chapter in her life to begin, this time in Melbourne, Australia. Preparing for quarantine when she arrives, she has devoted a lot of the room in her suitcase to toys, saying the children have suffered a lot from losing their father, leaving relatives and friends behind, but also feeling disoriented as they head to yet another country. Young Hazabra is not looking forward to another long plane ride. He's confused about where he is and his mother says she longs for him to feel like a child again. I'm just waiting to see uh, uh, on that day that my boy could go to school. I'm just uh, imagining uh, that uh, on that day that my boy uh, have a book, have a notebook, have a uh, something for school materials and go to school. This, that uh, day will be a very, uh, a very, I cannot say, a very good day for me. Greece evacuated some 367 Afghan citizens, mostly judiciary workers, including women judges and lawyers from Afghanistan in October. It was estimated then that Afghanistan had about 500 registered women lawyers and about 250 women judges. 41 people will go to Darwin and other 12 to Melbourne, including Neda via Singapore. As Neda passes through security to board her flight at the airport, others on the flight also express their excitement to be starting a new journey in their lives. This is the first time you are going to Australia, so I hope we can sit there and uh, start a new journey, a new life. This is just one picture of those who have suffered after the Taliban takeover. 
While these few dozens have managed to escape what is going on in the war-torn country and have avoided what is in store for millions, people back at home are really under a mountain of crisis. In what has already been referred to by many as a humanitarian crisis, more than half the Afghans are deprived of food, several thousands do not have shelter, markets and banks have collapsed, and with little international support in sight, it appears highly unlikely that the situation is improving in the immediate future. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Samsung Electronics Company Limited forecast a recovery in global tech device demand in 2022 after reporting its best fourth quarter profit in four years, but warned of ongoing challenges from supply chain issues and COVID-19. The tech giant said its memory chip business this year expects server demand to grow, attributed to increase in IT investments and new high-core CPUs, while mobile chip demand is likely to increase due to expansions of 5G-capable models. For non-memory chips, Samsung expected supply to remain tight due to rising penetration of 5G, solid high-performance computing demand, growing outsourcing from integrated device manufacturers, and continued inventory demand. The world's largest memory chip and smartphone maker posted a 53% rise in fourth-quarter operating profit to 13.9 trillion won, helped by brisk sales of memory chips and higher margins in chip contract manufacturing. Despite the coronavirus pandemic, Japan maintains order and unity. This is made possible not only by the Japanese, but foreigners who have integrated themselves into the local society. Known as essential foreigners, they are indispensable partners of the natives. Even after living in Japan, Yusuf adheres to his religious teachings, be it the food or prayers. He studied the Japanese language and passed the national qualification exam which was crucial to invite his family over. It was his strong wish to live with his family that motivated him to succeed. His job as a nurse has helped him gain trust and live with his loving family. Yusuf is living a truly fulfilling life in Japan. Nguyen Thi Mai Loan came to Japan from Vietnam at the end of 2008 to work for Misho, a clothing manufacturer in Tokyo. Her main job is working on the sewing machines and iron clothes. Since coming to Japan, she has studied katakana, kanji, hiragana every day, thinking about how she can improve on her own. A truly wonderful surprise and reward, she has passed the second grade of a private Japanese examination. Her hard work has paid off in the form of an honorable award. The difference in the customs and lifestyle here was confusing for her at first, but her Japanese and Vietnamese friends have helped her keep on. Integrated foreigners who have overcome differences in tradition and lifestyle uphold Japanese society. Japan will continue to accept and nurture these essential foreigners. The path towards decommissioning of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station is a huge challenge. On April 13, 2021, the government of Japan announced its basic policy based on which preparation for discharging the ALPS treated water of the plant into sea will be started. The news received immediate and widespread international attention and questions were raised about the safety. In Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station, preparation of discharging of ALPS treated water is progressing. The government of Japan TEPCO and other relevant parties are focused on making successful progress on this issue. It's a concrete step on the path of decommissioning the TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. Now we leave you with some mesmerizing visuals of India's 73rd Republic Day where the might and heritage of the country was on showcase this 26th January. Goodbye and take care.